la oportunidad de conocer de primera mano de expertos internacionales una perspectiva de la industria en el actual contexto. Invitamos al doctor Mike Elliott, líder global de minería de AY, con más de 34 años de experiencia en el sector. Su amplia experiencia le ha permitido asesorar a empresas mineras de China, Mozambique, Papúa Nueva Guinea, Zimbabue, México y Colombia, entre otros. Igualmente ha participado en muchas de las grandes transacciones, fusiones y privatizaciones que han transformado la industria a nivel nacional e internacional. Démosle la bienvenida. Buenos dias, uh, Minister, uh, colleagues of the mining industry. It's a great pleasure to be back here today in Cartagena to um, make a further address to, to the sector. Uh, this is my uh, third visit to Colombia and uh, it's, it's over a decade, so I've seen the dramatic changes that have been taking place broadly in Colombia. And, and very much what's taken place in the mining sector over that period, period of time. This morning, uh, the nature of my address is looking at the super cycle and the exit of the super cycle. And uh, what is the legacy of that for the mining sector? So could we bring the, uh, the slides up, please? Thank you. So this, this morning, in a brief overview, I'm going to very, very briefly look at what, what is, what was the, the super cycle, what's been the products of the super cycle, and then what has been the implications to the global mining sector. So first of all, the super cycle. Um, there's much debate amongst analysts and even between Mitch and myself. Uh, you'll probably hear some slight different variations on what, what, what represents a super cycle. But essentially, it's the fact that we've had an unprecedented period of growth within the sector from a decade or more ago, driven by the rapidly developing economies of the world, particularly those in Asia and particularly China. And we've had periods of growth, as you can see from this, from this chart, over the last century and a half of when we've had significant periods of beyond trend growth within, within the sector. And those have been certainly cycles which have been longer and more pronounced than the regular cycles that, expect, that we expect to see in this sector. Um, what it's also meant in the super cycle is that we've, we've generally seen that uh, revenues have increased dramatically over this period as prices elevated to encourage supply to chase demand. And so over a period of 10 years, it really took the sector, based on this price stimulus, to be able to increase its supply to be able to meet this burgeoning demand. And a demand, I might add, that while it might have slowed in its growth, is still growing. And so the fundamentals that have driven the super cycle uh, has been demand, but the way in which we manage either where we are in the cycle now or the correction that's occurring now is based on how the supply response has actually occurred. And as we can see here from this graph that um, you know, the strategies that we've often seen the sector take have actually been pro-cyclical. So the sector was slow to recognise the early stages of the super cycle and they've also been slow to recognise as supply has started to uh, catch demand and in some instances actually exceed demand. 
but this is not an issue around whether demand exists or not and whether demand is falling, but really the, whether we've got the best mix of supply to meet that demand going forward. So overall, and you'll hear very optimistic messages from both Mitch and myself this morning, talking about why we think this is still a very good outlook for, for the sector. And um, as everybody in this room would know, we get a lot of bad news about the sector in recent times. Um, it's time to some, sometimes focus in on some of those good things. So if we look at one of the reasons for, for optimism, I mentioned that certainly it's, it's uh, our view at EY that uh, from our fairly significant presence within China that the, the rise of urbanisation in China is, is still a juggernaut. Um, it's only about a year ago exceeded 50% urbanisation, will move to be something over 70%. Uh, that, by that we're talking hundreds of millions of people that have moved from uh, rural living into urban settings, moving from poverty into um, some form of middle, middle class. This, as we all know, has a very, very strong connection with, uh, with uh, metals demand that comes, and, and Mitch will talk about that a bit later. Another reason why I think we can have uh, optimism for what it means in terms of pricing within our sector um, what we do is very uh, energy intensive activity, converting large amounts of rock into powder that we quite often extract some value out, whether it's you know, pulverised coal or whether it's extracting minerals out of, out of this, um, which means that over time the mining sector is increasingly, as grades fall, becoming more and more energy intensive. And with energy costs generally around the world increasing, this means that uh, the cost of doing business increases, but it also is putting somewhat of a flaw under the prices that we expect within this, within this sector. Um, and those that are able to manage this part of it better than others will obviously profit and, and uh, benefit. Another part, which is the reality that's, that's been brought on by the, the super cycle, is higher prices have continually given the economic incentive to chase lower and lower grade materials. So you can see here a number of different commodities over the last uh, 40, 45 years and how we've seen a continual decrease in those grades. So while some of those grades at the, the lowest level may prove to be uneconomic at these current prices. Generally, the industry grades in all commodities have shifted down and what now becomes the economic cutoff grades, even at lower prices, um, are much better than where they were before. But this is putting, again, new pressures on the sector but is another reason why we should see some floor under prices. So now I'd like to turn to um, some of the products of the super cycle. I'm going to put my comments around seven major outcomes that I see have come as the legacies of what we have out of this period of unprecedented growth in our, in our sector. And I go through them rather, rather quickly, but each of these are both have implications for uh, companies in the sector, it has implications for governments which are in mining nations, and it has significant implications for the communities that host these uh, mining projects. So the first one is looking around uh, price volatility. And when you have such significant price stimulus out there to encourage new supply, when you turn that off, and in fact not only turn it off, but reverse the thrust to go in the other direction, you get the price impacts we're seeing today. So in some ways, if you were of the theory that we've completed the super cycle and we're now actually in a super correction, then you'd have the view that the correction in some ways will be as painful as the, uh, the super cycle was pleasurable. And what we will see is increased volatility of overshooting and undershooting uh, particular expectations for many years to come. So at EY, we see this is an environment we're going to have to live with coming out of the super cycle, volatility, companies cannot decide to just sit on the sideline and wait for volatility to, to, to pass. They actually have to engage with volatility. And volatility in its own right is not necessarily a total, total threat. Um, yes, it creates increased decision risk. Um, it means that if you go to experts, you're going to get great disparities between the outlook for the sector in different prices. So how can you make commercial decisions, uh, policy decisions, and community-based decisions based on such, such variety? 
And this is where companies will have to become much more adept at actually working in an environment of volatility, courtesy of the super cycle. So they have to learn how to invest. When is the right period to invest? Do you always wait for the bottom of the cycle? Or do you allow the fact that this cycle will be volatile over this period of time and we will see ups and we will see downs and sometimes in, in rapid progression from one another but not necessarily only be judged on being able to pick the bottom of the, sec of, of the cycle. Risk management becomes greater and while it's in many mining companies around the world, the thought of hedging is anathema because they believe they should be exposed to the mineral price, which gold producer in the room when the gold price was 1800 which could almost be given free options to, to put in a, a hedge protection at 1500 uh, at that time, don't wish today that that's exactly what they actually did. So risk management provides greater opportunity. I'll come back to the next theme, which is around trading and revenue en enhancement. I think that that's something which op is open the door and we can follow the, the, the trader's example on that of how they're making uh, income out of, out of volatility. And the last one I have there is around flexibility of operations. And, and this really relates to if prices are stable, having a flexible operation provides very little value. However, if you're able to vary your level of production quite without any real cost penalty, then your ability to gear up production when prices are volatile high and drop production when prices are volatile low is a great advantage. Even if you can blunt the amount of the peaks and the troughs on that, it can actually, or accentuate the, the, the peaks, blunt, blunt the troughs, is of great, great advantage. And for anybody that's got a financial bent in the room, quite often the way you create flexibility in your operations is substituting variable costs for fixed costs. So if your operation is more exposed to being able to a variable cost, you can change both up and down uh, based on, on uh, less cost than if you're always focused on trying to, ma to manage fixed costs. So the second area of the legacy I wanted to talk about is, is really focusing in on um, how we measure growth and returns. And this is important, again, not just for companies, but also for the nations that, that host them, is the global capital markets have got very skittish on the mining sector. And part of their focus has become very much around short-term measures. So this sector, because of its success over the super cycle, attracted large amounts of capital from non-traditional investors who were chasing the large returns that mining was generating relative to other sectors in all of our economies. We still have a number of those capital providers, but when commodity prices started to drop, they started to focus more from capital growth, because they were making capital losses, and looking to see this become more of a yield play where they were actually looking either for dividends, greater dividends, or looking for capital return. And so some of the measures the market are using on the sector now to judge the performance of our mining companies have become very short term in their focus. And one of the key one of those is actually looking at uh, return on capital employed. Now return on capital employed, if I look at where during the super cycle, the, the markets were focusing on production growth, revenue replacement or reserve replacement, expansionary capex, the larger the better, uh, looking at lazy balance sheets that had too much cash sitting on them, and they were basically re-rating projects through mergers and acquisitions. That was a world that we had last decade. Now, in the post cycle, we're now looking at return on capital employed, which quite frankly I think is a very poor metric uh, within this sector, given the long-term business that we're actually investing in, um, and looking at free cash flow. And so the choices are, you know, what can we do to lower cost? What can we do to raise productivity? What can we do to lessen the amount of capital that's consumed in our business? That's what the market's focusing in on. So that's why they're anti-exploration, they're anti-new cap capex being incurred. And it's a very difficult environment to operate in, in that from anything other than a short-term measure. But as any responsible company 
all country needs to do is look to long-term value, not just achieving these short-term metrics. And I use an example up there, this graph here, which is published by Anglo-American, which has already put a target out there for its ROCE, which is, is really 15% uh, ROCE. And, and a lot of what uh, Anglo-American is doing is look through that, through that particular lens, and, and that becomes a real, a real challenge. So we believe at EY that companies are in a dilemma between making long-term decision-making to protect, preserve and grow uh, value of their projects while also trying to satisfy the current market hunger for return on capital employed. And so really this capital allocation process that was happening through, through the mining companies is particularly challenging. And while it was great to hear the minister talk about his number one issue around getting you know, projects for, for Colombia, uh, that is a real challenge for a lot of operators of these mining companies, even being able to access that, that capital in Colombia or, or anywhere else. And so we've still got at least another year or so of... Um, capital optimization taking place within the sector, but we're starting to see some of the early green shoots within the sector starting to prepare for growth, um, but, but not necessarily seeing that happening either this calendar year and probably not, not the next. But during this period of time, projects are still suffering, so we couldn't just turn off the tap of, of projects. And there's still, um, as of sort of late last year, $791 billion worth of investment still in the pipeline for this sector. Um, presently, some from recent surveys that we did, 69% of those are still facing cost overruns despite this, this new um, attitude towards uh, capital discipline. And at least 50% of those are suffering delays. So in an environment where you have that, when you talk about opening up new provinces with new risks such as here in Colombia, uh, the gold mining sector here in Colombia, uh, it, it is very challenging when companies already have this very skittish attitude towards the way they're going to be deploying capital. Certainly, the companies in this room, we all got to do better on the way we deploy capital, but um, uh, we've got to work with government to be able to make that an easier path. Um, the third area I was going to look at is really around two, or third and fourth is around looking at margin. So in the past, in the super cycle, everybody's looking at growth. They're looking at maximising production, getting maximum revenue. Whereas now with lower prices, the focus is termed on margin. And there's two aspects of margin, revenue and, and also cost. And one of the big focuses that we've seen within the sector is that we're now moving towards this focus on, on cost. And what we have to do to improve not just our absolute costs through cost reduction, but our unit costs by increasing productivity. And that's really become the latest buzzword within, within the sector. Um, the graph I have here is quite interesting when you think about this in, from some of the earlier speakers today, the minister and elsewhere, is in fact, when you look at a transformation, um, there are things that are easy to do early on. You can s reset your supply chain. Uh, you can probably do that in the first year. You can start to reduce manpower, and many of us have done that. But when you start to look at the human technology interface, you start to redevelop your mine plans, that's something that takes considerably more, more time. And most of the mining companies in this room would be one, one place or another on that particular um, journey. Um, margin recovery is also around what we can optimise in terms of selling price. And I mentioned before that if you look at the products that we produce, over the super cycle, the traders, the commodity traders, became incredibly powerful. And, and they've actually grown massively in size and managed to actually eke out a very good uh, uh, profit uh, position out of the products that you produce. And what the sector's more looking at now is how can they enhance their own revenue by learning from what some of the traders have been doing. And we're starting to see this convergence between the producer trader, sorry, the, 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 the trader producer model, companies like 
uh, Glencore and Trafigura and Noble and the like, to the producer trader model, which would be all the big diversified starting to beef up their sales and marketing capabilities. And some, some research that my colleagues at uh, McKinsey did show that there's probably about eight percentage points in additional EBIT available for instituting a much more sophisticated approach to sales and marketing and, and adopting some of that, that trading approach. But to do that, the miners need to actually overcome some fallacies that exist. These are things that people sometimes believe to be true but are not necessarily true. The first of those is that we sell at spots, so there's no need to invest in marketing. Well, if that's true, then traders wouldn't be making any profits at all. So why are traders being able to trade things that are traded on the London Metals Exchange, like copper and nickel and so forth? Because there's profits to, to actually be, be made in that space. So that is fallacy number one. The second one is our comparative advantage is to mine operations. Fine, you can, you can take that, but what's the market buying? And if you're not producing what the market wants to buy and where it wants to buy it and when it wants to buy it, then that's when you're ceding an opportunity to, to, to the traders. Um, we, already take, we already price our products at, at a premium. Well, that's tactical marketing and uh, that only captures a portion of the upside. If you want to get the full 8% that McKinsey were talking about, then you need to go much more down, down the trader model. Um, and it's about investing in customer relationships. Well, the part that I see that the, the, the traders do in this space very successfully is they're actually able to understand that option value that's created by that value in, in use and being able to then orient your organisations from being production-led organisations to sales-led organisations that have a production cap capability I think will be a very important transformation of this mining sector over the next decade or so. One which is very close to all of our hearts in, in the room and no matter where you operate in the world is that the, the uh, super cycle gave us a set of expectations by governments all around the world that the mining sector can pay more. And we went through a period of, of enhanced profits, there is no doubt about that. But there is also many, many years that this sector has funded uh, you know, enhanced losses as well. And yet a lot of the policy positions that have been put in place all around the world were then reset during a period of the super cycle. And the capacity of the sector to actually pay and invest in that sort of climate is becoming uh, lesser and lesser as, as those margins de decrease more and more. So the expectation on this is that uh, uh, those that want to be most attractive uh, as a source of attracting foreign investment for the mining sector have to actually look at their fiscal arrangements, look at whether they have the appropriate fiscal incentives or more importantly a large amount of the fiscal disincentives for doing this. So it's a risk and reward uh, equation and it's up to countries to both manage the risk, so what can countries to partner with the sector to lower risk the approvals process, working with communities, etc., were important parts of that. But also the return. How do they actually enhance the return for, for miners? And that's an after-tax, after-royalties return associated with that. So in some ways, those that want to attract the investment, and if the minister wants to follow through on, on the plan that, that they have around projects, the number one issue they're focusing with, if you want to not only attract the companies, but the financiers that will that the companies in this room also have to convince to finance these, these projects, then the fiscal arrangements is something that needs to be addressed. Um, in a similar vein, maintaining our social licence to operate has never got harder. Uh, the way that communities have accelerated their expectations on the sector over the super cycle um, has, and, the, and their belief in the capacity of the mining sector to pay more and more to the communities has been, you know, uh, probably formed a disservice by the level of profitability that we had for some of those years within the period of the super, super cycle. And today we have to manage that, that the community expectations are up here, the capacity of the sector to actually meet those expectations are, are here. 
and in many areas that's being exploited by many part parties that have a philosophical opposition to mining and as we know there are a number of anti-mining NGOs out there and they manipulate this particular weakness that we have with our communities to actually take advantage and we see that actually happening on a global scale at this, this time, particularly within the, in the coal sector. So this is an area where we still have to be engaged with our communities, but we've got to be much more uh, in partnership with them, with our host governments, uh, to be able to address what is really possible, what is the role of government, what is the role of the companies that, that are hosting there, but deal with it on a, on a uh, uh, proactive basis. Uh, thinking that there's economies, particularly in this period of uh, financial stress within the sector, to cut back our investment, uh, even proportionally cutting back our investment, is a false economy and we will pay for that in future years if we don't maintain that. My final point is really looking at product substitution. Um, and, and this is one that not often focused on, but the super cycle generated a period of such high price stimulus for the sector that it also challenge some of the supply chains which our products go into. And so it lasted long enough that it instituted large amounts of research and development to find alternatives or to evaluate alternatives for the products that we actually do in all of the uses that we actually have. And while there's about seven different reasons for changing uh, for why substitution actually occurs, um, and, and not all of it has been price driven, it is actually a threat that we have that we didn't have before the super cycle took, took, took place where uh, substitutes, more economic substitutes for our products uh, have now been evaluated, tested and in some insta instances um, put into the, into the supply chain. So if I were to summarise what needs to be done from, from here, I think that we can't just operate the same business models in mining that we operated the last 10 years. We're in a very different environment now and many organisations are starting to realise that they actually have to adapt, not just to survive, but they've got to adapt to actually prepare for this next part of, of the cycle. Companies need to embrace volatility. We should not be scared of volatility. We should make volatility our friend. Uh, but through that, we've got to understand that a lot more and we've got to understand how our business is actually able to deal with, with volatility. We need to reset our metrics and focus those on long-term success. I think pandering too much to the short-term uh, market behaviours today is, 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 uh, might please somebody in the short term, but it's going to undermine long-term value. And I think that's something we have to start educating the market more about is about those, those longer-term measures. Um, because we're in a different part of the cycle, we need to redefine the role of governments and we need to redefine, uh, re redefine the role in which we, uh, what we mean by community benefits. And this needs to be a partnership, a partnership with communities, it needs to be a partnership with governments, but there's a lot to be, to, to be done to, to share the load and make sure that we're all working for the same cause. And to protect the stewardship of our products, we also have to think more about the down, downstream part of this and whether it's in coal and what needs to be done around finding you know, more imminent solutions for say carbon capture and storage, whether it's looking to, to still um, avoid the trade-off between maybe copper and, uh, and al aluminium for certain uses or graphene for, for, for copper. These are things that we need to actually invest in, in the product chains, not just delivering the raw, the raw material. So, Muchas gracias. I think that's a very ex still exciting time because change is always exciting in, in the sector and in many ways it's a very exciting time for, for mining in Colombia. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Dr. Elliot. Invitamos al Dr. Mitchell Hook, presidente del Consejo de Minerales de Australia. Es considerado uno de los más representativos exponentes de la industria minera australiana, con experiencia en asesoramiento de empresas en exploración, explotación y comercialización de minerales. Líder de importantes iniciativas de tipo tributario, comunicativo y de gestión para mejorar la competitividad del sector. Mr. Chairman, Roberto Junjito of the Colombian Mining Association, Mr. Santiago Angel, 
is the CEO of the same association, member of the board of directors, distinguished guest. Buenos dias. Mi espinel no es muy bueno. Mi inglés es solo un poco mejor. Mi hermano es aún peor. Así que, si me lo permiten, voy a hablar un australiano. It's an absolute pleasure to be invited to address this conference, both in my former and current capacities. Santiago has asked me to take a global perspective on, and I quote, where the mining industry is going in the face of current depressed commodity prices, and how should companies go about addressing the hurdles confronting them, all in 25 to 35 minutes. This is indeed a challenge and a compliment. So to try and do justice to Santiago's request, uh, like my friend Mike, I'm going to break this presentation into three parts. The first is the demand and supply equation, which is heavily dominated by supply side movements, or the lack of, in response to depressed prices, more so than any material structural changes to demand, which, surprising to many, as Mike just said, is more of a constant than a dynamic variable in the current depressed state of the industry. Second, I'm going to build on what Mike has just told you about what successful companies are doing in managing the challenges of a less buoyant market. Principal among them, a structural deterioration in their competitiveness, productivity growth, and access to capital as the industry necessarily shifts from the price-led growth of the first decade of the so-called millennium boom to volumes and margins, as you've just heard. And thirdly, I'm going to do, assess, I should say, what governments need to be doing to support mining companies transform their businesses and to create an environment conducive to investment and growth. And I'll try to spend 10 minutes on each of those three areas. So about this time last year when I first came here, I was far more bullish about the potential recovery in commodity prices than is evident today. And I'm still more of a bull than a bear, but I have come back to the field in moderating my view. And I say this because demand has not materially shifted, but rather the supply side has not to date proved to be anywhere near as what economists call elastic. I'm not an economist, but it means it's not directly responsive to the changing scene of depressed prices. This is, of course, manifestly so in iron ore and coal, arguably more so than in base and precious metals. So to pick up on one of Santiago's terms, which I like, a take-home message is to reason that the current depressed state of the industry circumstances are a consequence of slowing demand for our products is to misread the underlying fundamentals to both demand and supply. A significant part of the industry's predicament today and its central focus has much to do with addressing the supply side legacies of the first decade of the millennium boom as you just so capably heard from Mike. Now, it's no news to anybody in this room that growth and demand for our products are directly correlated to economic growth, and it's no news to you that all, nearly all of the growth in demand is directly related to the fortunes of the emerging, rapidly emerging economies. You also heard Mike talk about a super cycle. You could go further and say it's a mega cycle or you could be in the camp that I'm in to say that actually this is a new normal growth trajectory. We are actually in the new normal. There will be cyclical volatility around the longer term growth trend, but another take home message is that my view is that there is far more substance in the underlying fundamentals to the structural growth trajectory than there are risks 
in the cyclical volatility. The global economic and social reweighting between the developed and emerging economies driven by their urbanisation and industrialisation is structural and it is sustainable. I see no material shift in that current global growth trajectory. The bipolar economy, global economy will continue. The emerging economies will continue to carry the weight of global growth, albeit at a slower rate, but off a much bigger base. The developed economies will continue to struggle with the exception of the United States. Together with China, the US, the US and China, they are the twin engines of global growth. The US is 25% of the global economy and is projected to grow at about 25% of global growth in the near term. China is also expected to contribute 25% of global growth off a 10% global GDP base. The US has unleashed a new drive in manufacturing, including an increase in reshoring. In other words, we talk about offshoring. When stuff moves off, well, they're actually bringing back manufacturing capacity, particularly that which is dependent on energy intensity. They have technologically launched themselves towards energy independence by the turn of this decade. They've driven already world-leading productivity growth rates. And they've underpinned a fragile financial system with a boost to business competitiveness and investment confidence with a series of very successful money printing exercises under the banner of quantitative easing. Now, income inequality and flat wages growth means they've got some ways to go. The EU, European Union, continues to struggle under the weight of debt, toxic assets, weak underlying fundamentals, reform inertia, a culture of state dependency and entitlements, 50% of their GDP comes from public sector expenditure and a real risk of deflation. But even Europe, while it continues to be a drag on global growth, has embarked on a series of structural reforms, uh, particularly its own massive program of 60 billion euros a month of quantitative easing which will artificially peg the euro, low, the euro lower, boost investment and put a floor under asset prices. The fall in crude oil has provided a stimulus to global economic growth, uh, feeding into lower energy and raw material costs as inputs to industrial activity and increasing consumer purchasing power. But of course, it's a two-edged sword for those economies that are ex net exporters of oil, such as Colombia. So we've seen in Europe emergence, what they call the emergence of growing shoots, where the euro has deflated by 12% against the trade weighted index uh, over the past year. Uh, that coupled with lower energy costs has sponsored a renewed focus on exports. You have a look at the European firms that are actually doing well, they're actually operating outside of the European market. And we're seeing a resurgence in growth to exports, GDP ratios in Germany, France, Spain, and even in Italy. And the shift in the EU's culture has also seen a flight of equity, a flight of capital, capital, I should say, into equity markets in Europe. Who would have thought that? Both in the expectation that quantitative easing will put a floor under asset prices, even lift them, like it did in the USA and Japan, uh, and also be uh, a boost to economic recovery and business confidence. The emerging economies will dominate the global growth trajectory. They account for three quarters of global growth, of which China alone accounts for nearly a quarter of a lift, as I said earlier on, 25% lift in global growth. And no wonder, when you look at their rates of urban population growth, rising middle income class purchasing power, increasing industrialization and emerging growth in their services sector, and the current and prospective development of the resource-rich endowment becoming significant global suppliers, and of course boosting GDP and income within their own countries. Now I can spend a lot of time in this space, but I'm just gonna pick up on five underlying drivers for that 
my optimism in the growth, the continuing growth of the emerging economies. The first one is that they have embraced the open market. They have continued with their transformation of their product, capital and labour markets, the reform to their governance systems and regulatory institutions. They've embraced new technologies and they've looked for alternative sources and access to capital. I don't see them materially diverting from that path of the, op the embrace of open market reforms, even if some of the signs on labour market reforms, resource nationalism and social activism here uh, in some parts of Latin America and elsewhere across the globe might suggest otherwise. Added to which the developed economies are continuing their path of macro and microeconomic reforms, again, even if the inertia in Europe might suggest otherwise. So what has all this meant? Well, it has transformed global trade and commerce. It has transformed society's attitudes and expectations of governments and businesses. Societies have moved over the last 30 years, they've moved from the collective doctrine of government controlled, industry protected and union dominated to the aspirations of the individual. It's one of the reasons why you're getting so much more community activism and focus on what we do. Because it's all coming back to the wants, needs and expectations of the individual. And we've seen much greater demands for sustainable development, greater expectation on our environmental and social stewardship of the assets of which we are responsible or under our care. And the distribution of global economic growth is much better. With open economies, the benefits of economic activity wash through economies much better and are much better distributed and much more sustainable with less risk of inflation. The last time we had a mining and agriculture boom in Australia, it ended in tears because we were rigid, centrally controlled, the government was in charge of every arm of macroeconomic policy and our economy overheated on account of the heat generated in a part of it. Not so this time round. Every Australian is $300 a week better off. $300 a week better off on account of the mining boom in Australia. Justifiably, the focus has been on China's growth and the fact that it's slowing. Well, it's probably not a bad idea to put all that in perspective. At 7% growth on the second largest economy in the world today is equivalent to between 12 and 14% growth on the 15th largest economy when the boom started. And most economists consider China to be facing structural headwinds to future growth. Changes in labour, capital and productivity are all slowing down. But most of them also conclude that that rather abrupt slowdown is more cyclical than structural. And you only have to look at the proclamations of the Chinese leaders they publicly recognize, to, to, to get the confidence that it is only more cyclical than structural. They've publicly recognized the imperative, even the urgency, to continue market reforms. They're pushing ahead with more open market reforms to state-owned enterprises. They're liberalizing the banking sector. They're further moving towards the normalization of their exchange rate, in other words, floating. They're developing financial markets and they're tackling pricing and taxation arrangements. They want a modest and controlled downturn in GDP growth as they work to rebalance their economy from the foreign direct investment and export drivers, which was so typical of the first part, first decade of the boom, over here to consumption. Now at the moment, consumption is only less than 50% of their GDP. It needs to be a lot higher as they move into that phase of sustained growth. That will mean that they need to increase household earnings so their reforms to the household sector, their changes to the credit arrangements, their changes to that HUKOU, H-U-K-O-U, which is the system of uh, in, uh, urban, urban apartheid, where people coming in from the western areas and the urban areas don't have the same privileges of housing and education as people who are indigenous to the cities. Well, as they continue to build cities and urbanise their populations, that kind of 
uh, approach will need to change, and they're on that path of reform. It's not just about China. When you look at India, India is the next cab off the rank, the next taxi off the rank. Uh, their growth is rather different from China. They're already predominantly a services economy, and so they'll be moving into building a manufacturing base whereas most developing economies go from agriculture to manufacturing to services. India actually skipped manufacturing and now coming back. Africa, well, the economic and social development in Africa is really just quite a remarkable transformation. Uh, and they're going to have um, some 2.4 billion more people in coming into this, co coming into, we'll start again. By, by 2050, Africa's population will almost double with another 2.4 billion people in sub-Saharan Africa uh, increasing by that space alone. And as you will know better than me, the prospects for Latin America are a mixed bag. They've enjoyed remarkable growth and development over the past decade. But today, declining commodity prices, a slowdown in major trading partners, stalls have reformed, even backsliding to resource nationalism and emerging protectionism, coupled with domestic tensions in some of the largest economies, particularly political scandals, internal security, increasing social activism, they're all proving to be headwinds to investment attractiveness and growth in Latin America. Added to which, lower oil prices, as I said earlier, are starting to weigh heavy, heavily on public accounts. The second driving factor is urbanization will continue almost unabated. China. If it grows at 7%, it will urbanise another 9 million people per year. India is growing even more strongly and will urbanise another 12 million per year, with the rest of developing Asia urbanising at a rate of 16 million people a year. To put that into perspective, outside of India and China, five countries collectively in Southeast Asia will grow their entire populations over the next decade at a rate equivalent to a new Brazil each year. Africa is expected to urbanise 30 million people a year over the same period. And Latin and Caribbean are already more urbanised than Europe, but will add an extra 5 million people to urban areas each year. And you put that together with the fact that their purchasing power parity and their minerals and energy per capita consumption intensities have a long ways to run to peak demand. The per capita income of China today is about 12% of that of the USA, and India's is at 3% of the USA, and is arguably 20 years behind that of China in terms of development. And they are well short of the point where demand for minerals commodities becomes insensitive to changes in income growth. And this is very important when we're looking at projected demand increases for our growth for our products. As they go through those phases of industrialization and urbanization, the demand grows to a point where it, up here, where it hits saturation, where increasing demand is not actually sensitive to increases in income levels. It doesn't mean that demand contracts, it just means that it increases at a decreasing rate to a point of saturation. That's particularly so in iron ore. That was China went through the steel intense industrialised phases and now moving more into consumption. The iron ore, the per capita consumption rates at that point of saturation in the United States are about 650 kilograms per head. In the more rapidly industrialising economies of Japan and South Korea, it's higher at 850 kilograms per head. China's import of iron ore, sorry, China's consumption of iron ore today is running at about 740 kilograms per head. But in the top 10 provinces, they're about 11, 1200 kilograms per head. In the top, in the lowest 10 provinces, they're about 100. Most people think that it's gonna plateau out somewhere in the order of about seven or 800 kilograms per head, which gives you a steel market of about 850 million tons. Last year, it was about 740. So don't really expect much more demand from China for steel ingredients of iron ore and coking coal, uh, it's more likely to plateau 
and so too will the seaborne trade be unlikely to move beyond much more than an increase from 1.4 to 1.6 billion tonnes. Now you can run the same exercise across the base metals uh, and energy, uh, the base metals and not so much gold but energy intensities, but given the co that um, thermal coal is close to your heart and your interests, let's just have a look at that. From 210, from 2010 to 2035, global primary energy demand is projected to increase by a third. Global electricity demand to increase by nearly 70%. And thermal coal demand to increase by nearly 50%, of which 90% of that will come from the emerging economies. Electricity demand is expected to double in India alone by 2025. Coal dominates the world's electricity generation projects under construction or approved. There's an additional 325 gigawatts on track. Now to put that in perspective, in the last decade, the world generated 550 gigawatts of new coal-fired capacity. Now of course, coal and uranium have continued to suffer a continual barrage uh, from a criticism from community activists more on ideological grounds than any pragmatic consideration. But if there's one thing, if there's just one thing that I've picked up in my 25 years as a CEO in public policy, it is that bad policy rarely endures the test of the market. Whether that market is in the form of consumption demand or popular opinion. Irrational positions just simply won't endure the market. And if governments run out of subsidies for renewable energies, and if the community doesn't think there's a tangible dividend in environmental gains, and that there's nothing in it from them, you will see that kind of popular activism diminish markedly. If it can't be justified in the market, it simply won't endure. So, Gold's the other one. Uh, it's a unique, of course, in that price drives production in gold, not the other way around. And demand is a composite of increasing consumerism in China and India, and markets looking for strategic reserves of capital more acutely attuned to global economic and social political uncertainty. The fourth growth driver the rapid, is the emerging rapid economies are also resource rich. They're dominating the world's minerals reserves. The emerging economies hold between 70% and 95% of the world's minerals reserves. And by virtue of their social and political reforms, they, have, they came into the market quite rapidly. Uh, geared supply, boost national GDP, and increase consumer purchasing power. Now that's somewhat, that momentum is somewhat subdued, as I mentioned earlier on, but it's not going anywhere. On the supply side, more generally, um, the structural adjustments in response to, to depressed commodity prices has lagged expectations, as I said. And the key fact has been the imperative to increase volumes, as Mike was saying, to reduce unit costs, to improve margins, as he said. And in the case of coal in Australia, we suffer the legacy of the overhang of take or pay contracts. And of course, companies looking to build market position as a counter cyclical strategy. Mike talked about the pro-cyclical nature of the industry as a counter-cyclical stra strategy for when the market inevitably turns as demand catches up to supply. So I spent a bit of time in that market space, probably more than I should have, and the reason is because there's an awful lot of pessimism. Because the industry is pro-cyclical, in other words, it follows the cycles, we tend to reinforce the negative sentiment, not only within our industry, but also in the capital and product markets. And that's one of the reasons, as Mike said, why we tend to have more cyclical volatility around that longer term trend, because we actually reinforce the overshooting on the downside, just as we reinforce the overshooting on the upside. So what all this means? Minerals demand is on a steadily increasing trajectory, but with some cyclical volatility around a long term trend of growth. We're gonna see a shifting profile of metals consumption and per capita intensities in the relatively rapidly growing emerging economies. The price elasticity of supply has moved 
but it's more inelastic in iron ore and coal than it is in the base metals. Demand will catch up to supply, and when it does, we'll see a firming in prices. The cost cutting of today, though, means, of course, that the long-run equilibrium of marginal costs is down. So the floor in the price is probably going to be lower. Again, a point that Mike made. So I don't see, and the market doesn't see, the market balance to start to favour demand for another 12 to 18 months, out to the end 2016, 2017, but the underlying fundamentals are very strong. Which brings me to my second topic, uh, and that is that the fundamental legacy of the boom era was a structural deterioration in the competitiveness uh, of our businesses, largely on account of our own operations and our own actions, but there were some external factors. As you heard from Mike a moment ago, the first phase of the boom was to actually remedy capacity constraints. We went after production like there was no tomorrow. Um, the culture was for absolute production, almost irrespective of what it meant to the structural nature of our costs base. Operating systems, performance measures and accountabilities and the business culture was all about growth. Now costs always rise to revenues. Before we think we're too critical of ourselves, costs always rise to revenues whenever there is margin in it. And in the drive for capacity and project pipeline growth, urged on by a lot of the investors, uh, we increased equipment and labour costs and lower ore grade operations became economic. The E in economic demonstrated resources had a whole new perspective. Even to the point where we saw companies determining net present value calculations on the basis of spot prices, not the long run equilibrium of marginal costs. Now there are a lot of positives in that period of expansion, but the negatives, as you just heard from Mike, is that we ran into the perfect storm. Supply caught up to demand much quicker than many expected, particularly from the emerging resource rich countries. We're now seeing access to resources narrow, both in terms of land access and ore grades. We're seeing product and capital markets tighten in the face of uncertain global economic growth. And again, as Mike said, investors looking in a different direction for return on their investment portfolios. Society's expectations have intensified, complicated by a resurgence in community activism. But it's transfer, transcended, it's gone beyond environmental activism or the conservation estate, as we call it, to far more about farmers, land access, and communities having a share in what we do. So we, we have excessively an unsustainable operating cost structure. We have poor declining labor and capital productivity, poorly performing assets, and we've seen an erosion in our social license to operate. So what that meant is the industry has shifted from the price-led growth into the austerity phase after reduced costs, increasing volume, tackling productivity and capital discipline. But the industry's austerity drive has made significant headway, but has actually proved, but, but by reducing costs and increasing volumes has actually proved to be a poor proxy for productivity. Productivity growth is actually a very multifaceted complex. It's not just about technology, it's not just about costs, it's not just about volumes, it's the lot. But there is one thing that's constant through productivity and that's change. Don't confuse invention with innovation. Creativity, creativity or invention creates the knowledge but it's the way in which it's applied, it's the way in which it's executed that actually gives us the real value add. And I suggest to you that there's a lot of value sitting on the table in the way in which our companies operate, the way in which they go about the business of culture and getting integrated systems right for real and tangible synergies throughout the whole supply chain. And that's mostly about behavioural change. So it actually can be quite progressive in the sense of reaping rewards with little or no extra cost. But it does involve a whole of business transformation. 
A lot of people look at culture in a different way. To me, it's the non-physical forces of change in the way in which people behave as an integrated unit. So I've identified the top seven issues. I'm going to run out of time here, but I've identified the top seven that I think successful companies are doing in managing this austerity and counter-cyclical tension well. The first one is that they have adopted a systems approach. They have moved their businesses from the silos. They have understood that we know that we have to have a whole of change integrated systems approach from exploration all the way through to marketing. Yet the industry's had a tendency to operate in silos. The successful operators of actually fixing the integration gaps in their mining and supply logistics operations. They're building a culture of team, operation and integration. And they've got a systems approach to planning and replanning. A feedback loop across the entire operation from the mine plan through construction, ramp up and full production and then back again to the original mine plan design if that doesn't all work as well as it should. They've established transparency and accountability in each and all aspects of their operations built around that systems approach. They understand that poor culture, poor culture will eat systems for breakfast every day. The systems are the substance, the culture is the application. Attitude begets behaviour, attitude always before behaviour. And if you don't get the culture right, and if you don't get the, the behavioural patterns, patterns of a systematic approach right, then your business will continue to operate in unintegrated, uncohesive, non-collaborative approaches. Now by people skills I mean people being able to relate and lead teams by understanding that understanding the difference between competition and achievement. When I was playing rugby I was never going to pass the ball to the bloke who had designs on my position. I had to think team and I'd pass the ball to him if it actually meant the team was going to be far more successful. So the companies that actually get it are getting their people to think more in terms of performance than their own career and their own career advancement. The test of team is when you're sitting on the bench waiting to get another go and you've been dropped and you still want your team to win, not fail because that means you will then get recalled. There aren't too many people who actually understand that culture of team. So the successful companies are in that space and they are building capacity for systems dominated operations. We had a lot of systems thinkers and, and, and practitioners back in the days of the 90s when we had to have productivity gains. And most of those productivity gains were traded away to consumers in the form of lower prices. And we had a capital strike. Well, a lot of those system thinkers were essentially became discretionary expenditure through the boom years of the drive for absolute production. We need to bring them back. And it's not something we do well in this industry. We talk about the intersection of soft and hard engineering, but we don't do it well. And it's understandable, because all our people are engineers, uh, metallurgists, earth scientists, chemical engineers, accountants, financial lawyers, they actually don't have a lot of people skills. And that's an area where in the teaching space, we can do a lot to build capacity. The other thing they're doing is they're much better differentiating the value drivers. A lot of the big companies were cutting costs across the board, irrespective of actually differentiating where the real value drivers lay. So they're keenly differentiating those value drivers and they're working out where they are, what they are and how they are. And they've also got much greater increased transparency and accountability to their operating systems. So they're benchmarking their operational targets. Uh, they are, uh, they've got a focus and a discipline on the measurements, the performance, and the feedback loops to how they're actually operating. The digitising of theoretical practices and real-time operational data is adding a much greater capacity for improving functional capability, systems approaches and operational interdependency. The sixth area is a commitment and skills in earning and maintaining a social licence to operate. We heard a fair bit about that from Mike. Well, a social licence to operate is the unwritten social contract with the host community. It's probably as, if not more important, than the regulatory licence. 
And companies who've successfully operated in that space, they've moved from the mantra that was so characteristic of this industry back in the last century, we used to decide, announce, and defend. Today, it's engage, listen, learn, and empathize. The real skill in community engagement is to empathize. And empathy means equity. And equity means more than just having some money or some financial interests. It means having an opportunity to be part of the economic activity, whether that's jobs, local content, whatever, in other services industries. And it also comes down to just having a say. Don't confuse having a say with a veto. Free prior informed consent is about a say. It's about earning the social license to operate. It is not free prior informed veto. A veto is the responsibility of the sovereign state. You should never allow companies to be put between a rock and a hard place, the community and the decision of the government to determine a project going ahead. Companies, though, need to earn that social license to operate it and value it. Lastly, in, uh, in my key determinants, the counter-cyclical behaviours. Again, as you heard, we are pro-cyclical. We tend to follow the cycles, and that way we tend to be far more reactive than proactive. But if you look at the successful companies, they are actually understanding that austerity doesn't have to be fetal position-like behaviour, that you can actually set yourself up to be well positioned in a counter-cyclical sense. So, finally in five minutes, let's go to what governments ought to be doing. And I'll just summarise these probably less than five minutes, very quickly, because I'm sure this will be a matter for discussion in the panel. If you look around the world, you can see what companies are doing in voting with their feet about where they actually will deploy their strategic capital. The world's awash with resources. Natural endowment does not equate with competitive strength. And this is a global village. It's borderless capital, borderless people, borderless technology. We've all seen that. And the resources that we deploy globally are actually the value add to what's in the ground. It's only dirt. It's only dirt while it's in the ground. So they look for these signs. Firstly, the liberalisation of their economies, the embrace of open market reforms I referred to earlier. Secondly, they look for political stability in de democratic and institutional governance, including at the local level. And they're looking for governments to have an ability to lead and get things done. A clear separation between the powers of the judiciary, politics and the church. Very, very important. Third is they're looking for the security and the rule of law. Trust. Trust is a vital ingredient to confidence to invest. It's a vital ingredient to social license to operate. You must have a platform of mutual respect and trust. They're looking for transparency and, a, and accountability in the observance of property rights. The security of tenure is paramount with capacity to transfer ownership. They're also looking for the adoption of international covenants. Now, now why do I say that? particularly on trade and investment? Well, because under the UN Charter, it's quite legal for governments to nationalise, expropriate or transfer foreign ownership, but they must do so with appropriate and proper compensation. So you need to look, those of us who are in the global investment game are looking for countries that are part of those international covenants as a defence under law to anybody pinching their assets uh, under the UN Charter's capability. The fourth thing they're looking for is fiscal stability. Sound macroeconomic management, particularly levels of public and private indebtedness relative to GDP. They're looking for progressive taxation regimes. Thank you. They're looking for progressive taxation regimes. They want to know what the predetermined taxation liabilities are. Resource nationalism is a creeping cancer and a critical deterrent to investment. Fifth, they're looking for stable and competent regulatory arrangements, predictable, efficient and effective regulatory arrangements. Uncertainty in the permitting processes are major deterrents. Regulatory duplication and inconsistencies, a lack of cohesion between the mining and the environment sections. 
massive deterrent, Ex uncertainty and excessive delays concerning the administration and the interpretation, uncertainty concerning disputed land claims, uncertainty around which parts of the country are quarantined and sterilised from ex exploration. Sixth, they're looking for infrastructure, the adequacy of infrastructure and plans to develop and build infrastructure. Eighth, they want a commitment to sustainable development and intergenerational equity with all of its manifestations. And lastly, they're looking for a culture of shared responsibility appropriate to what is in essence a joint venture. Just, in, just as in Australia here, the minerals are owned by the state. The companies bring the wherewithal to add value. And it's a two-way deal. If governments use us as a political whipping boy, that is not conducive to a joint venture. If governments won't support us in the enforcement of the rule of law, that is not conducive to a joint venture. If governments won't actually articulate a very strong sense of support for the minerals industry, that's not conducive to a joint venture. We want to be real partners. We don't want to be considered as apartheid capital. We don't want our economic activities to be considered, our business activities to be considered as economic, uh, uh, as economic apartheid. And the politics of envy or class warfare have no place in public policy as the terrible super profits tax debate in Australia so aptly demonstrated. It's worth reflecting that natural endowment is only dirt while it's still in the ground. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias al doctor Hook por su intervención.